Good morning. Good morning. Well, we begin Lent today. We take this time. Started this past Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. Some of you may have uh, participated in that in some form or fashion. But it ushers in the season of Lent, as we call it. And as much as we look forward to Easter Sunday and the celebration and the rejoicing, and even as we look forward to Palm Sunday and the celebration, this period of time that we call Lent is a period in which we spend our time reflecting on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Here at OCC, we preach Christ crucified. We don't shy away from that. We also preach Christ resurrected. Amen. Because ultimately, as Christ followers, that is what we celebrate. But we acknowledge and we recognize that Christ suffered and died for us. And so as Pastor Kelly and I were considering what to do in this season, I had read a book uh, a few years back called The Final Words. And the author, Adam Hamilton, had written a book previously that was called The Last 24 Hours of Jesus. And he took you through everything that happened in that final 24 hours. In final words, he takes you through these seven final statements that Jesus made from the cross. And for those of you that don't know, um, saying anything when you are being crucified takes a lot. And so we know that if Jesus was expending the breath to say out loud what he had to say, they must have been important things to hear. Because we know the last words of people who die are important. If they're going to expend their final breath saying anything, it's usually pretty important and we ought to listen. So Pastor Kelly and I decided that this would be a great Lenten series as we reflect on Christ crucified. Now Lent is a period of time when we are to reflect on our own sin and we are to reflect on what Christ did on the cross for us. That's why we chose to use the clips from The Passion of the Christ. Now, if you've never seen this movie, some people shy away from it because it's brutal. It's true. But I encourage you to at least watch it once. Try to get through it. Because it truly, in my opinion, reflects and shows really what Christ went through for you. And whether or not you watch it ever again, watching it once will be seared into your memory. It's a far cry from the movies that we're used to, like The Greatest Story Ever Told, and The Son of God, and, and such, where we see Jesus, handsome as ever, barely bloody, hanging from the cross, speaking in a British accent. <laughs> Good movies. But the reality, to hear what we heard in the Passion of the Christ here, Jesus speaking in Aramaic and being spoken to, just sends the message home. And as hard as it is to look at, to see his bloody and beaten body, is a good reflection for us to recognize what Jesus really did. So I hope you'll hang in there with us. The clips are only less than a minute, but it sends a powerful message. And we start today with the first words that he spoke. Father, forgive them. And this is recorded in Luke. 
And not all the sayings of Jesus are written down in every single gospel. Because remember, each of the gospels are from a different viewpoint. And Luke, in particular, interviewed a lot of people to get what he got and put down. So Luke records these words. And it starts in chapter 23, verse 32 today. And it reads this way. There were also two criminals let out with Jesus to be put to death or executed. When they came to a place called the skull, the soldiers crucified Jesus and the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. The soldiers threw lots. This is like casting, throwing dice. To decide who would get his clothes. This was prophesied in scripture, in the Psalms. The people stood there watching and the leaders made fun of him, sneered him, mocked him. And Jesus saying, saying to Jesus, he saved others, let him save himself if he is God's chosen one, the Christ, the Messiah. The soldiers also made fun of him, coming to Jesus and offering him some, some vinegar or sour wine as it was. They said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And to add insult to injury, they put at the top of the cross these words, this is the king of the Jews. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now you can look at this in a variety of ways as to who is them. Who is, who is Christ asking God to forgive? He easily could have said this prayer to God in, in silence, but he said it out loud, having to pull himself up, nailed to the cross, in excruciating pain. And he says, Abba, forgive them. But they don't know what they do. We know that Jesus, being God in the flesh, was certainly asking for forgiveness for the soldiers who mocked him and threw dice for his clothes, gave him sour wine. The crowd, who just a week earlier was saying Hosanna in the highest, yeah. is now hurling insults. And let's not forget the religious leaders. Saying if you're truly the Messiah, save yourself. Come down from that cross. But there was someone else there that needed forgiveness. It was us. Christ came, God in the flesh, to forgive us long before we were even born. Christ came to save us from our sins. Christ came to forgive us us. And it wasn't a cheap gift either. Because God's grace, God's gift of grace is not cheap. You see, some people say that the church focuses too much on sin. That we talk too much about sin. We try, some churches try to play it down and say that it's not a big deal. Going so far as to even not even want to use the word sin for fear that we'll make somebody uncomfortable. It's a mistake. You screwed up. But sin is sin. And we need to call it out. We need to recognize it for what it is. It's in our human nature. We are born into it with the mistake 
that Adam and Eve made in the garden, when they screwed up, sin entered the world. And God had a plan to redeem us right from the get-go. Sin is a bad word, but it doesn't mean that we just wash over it and not recognize it for what it is. In translation, sin means to miss the mark, to stray from the path. And as Christ followers, our goal is to be following Jesus on his path. And yet, we stray from it. Every day we get up and we miss the mark. <laughs> I know I do. Yeah. I try and I try to do my best to follow Jesus, to stay on that path, and invariably I step off. I do something that I shouldn't. I said something I shouldn't. But I know that my sins have been forgiven. I know that Christ died on the cross for all the sins that I committed and all the sins that I would commit. As long as I remain obedient to him, as long as I try to stay on that path and continue to follow him. Now this isn't to say that following Jesus requires work. In a sense it does. But that's not where my salvation comes from. It requires work because I have to battle against my human nature to allow my spiritual nature to do what God wants me to do. That's why we call it being obedient. To be obedient, we have to work at that. Otherwise, we will fall. We will stumble. And some people stumble so far that they fall away. Not that they're a lost cause, but they think they can't ever get back. We need forgiveness. That's why we talk about sin. If we didn't talk about sin and I just talked about forgiveness, you'd probably not think anything of it. You would think, what's the big deal? But we need to be reminded. Because sin is a problem we never outgrow. It dogs us every day. But grace is also there every day. God's grace is a gift. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 8 reads, When we were unable to help ourselves, at the right time, Christ died for us sinners. Very few people will die for a righteous person. Although perhaps for a truly good or a noble person, someone might possibly die. But God shows his great love for us in this way. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Christ didn't wait for us to get our act together. God didn't say, nope, got to be perfect. Got to have it all together. Got to have it all figured out. And then I'll show you grace. If that was the case, we would all be waiting a long, long time. But that's not the kind of God we have. God showed his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing God we have. What a loving God. You see, in ancient times, in, in Hebrew tradition, once a year on the Day of Atonement, they would get two goats, and they would take one goat, and after the priest laid his hands on it, said a blessing, and basically slaughtered this goat as an offering to God for the sins of the people. And then the other goat, they would take, and he would lay his hands on it, and they would place the sins of the people on that goat. 
And then they would send that out into the wilderness. Maybe it would survive, maybe it wouldn't. But it represented, it was a tangible reminder of our sins being taken away. Now this was something that was done from the time of Moses. That's a lot of goats. It's a lot of sin. But yet it never seemed to take care of it. It never took care of the problem. It was just a tangible reminder that our sins are always there. They called it a scapegoat. That's where we get that word from. The goat that's set off into the wilderness is the scapegoat. And Jesus became not only the high priest, but also the scapegoat. He was the one who took on the sins of the world, the sins of the people, and died on that cross. There's a funky religious word that they use called prevenient. I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> prevenient. And it means that which goes before. Because while we were still sinners, God went before us and took on those sins. God was there before. God's grace is at work in us before we even know we need it. The Holy Spirit is working in people constantly, even when people don't realize it. God is bringing people in and out of our lives continuously, saying words of encouragement, sharing the gospel. For some, it falls on deaf ears, and others it becomes a seed that's planted and is watered and ultimately comes to fruition when someone finally decides to make that decision for Christ. God's grace is at work before we even know we need it. Forgiveness is really one of those hard things. It's one of those things that people struggle with so much. Because when we're hurt, we want justice. When we're wronged, we want people to pay. And yet, Jesus modeled forgiveness for us. On the cross, after being scourged, beaten, mocked, cursed, he still had the wherewithal to say, Father, forgive them. Jesus told his disciples, love your enemies. Jesus modeled that. He loved his enemies. Even to his dying breath. In Matthew chapter 6, his disciples ask him, how should we pray? And he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. And even in the Lord's Prayer, he, he says, Forgive us our debts, our trespasses, our sins, the perversion you, you wanted to follow. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts with us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. And then he says these words. Yes, for if you forgive others for their sins, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. Now I hear you saying, well, you just got done saying that Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and now you're saying that God won't forgive our sins. That doesn't make any sense. In a sense, it doesn't. But if you look at it from the perspective that we've been forgiven and therefore we should willingly forgive. 
And if we choose not to forgive, and we say that, well, God forgave me, but I can't forgive you, and we allow that bitterness and everything to kind of take hold, it's really saying more that we don't really believe that God forgives or that God hasn't forgiven us. Because if we can't forgive, that's probably the view that we have of God and why we carry it around so much and why we struggle so much with, with forgiving ourselves. God has forgiven you. When we forgive ourselves or when we forgive others who have wronged us in some way, we throw open the jail cell. Because lack of forgiveness holds us captive. Lack of forgiveness breeds anger, bitterness, victimization. Sometimes think people hold on to the lack of forgiving because it's nice to be the victim. It's nice to play over and over in your head how this person has wronged you. But really all they're doing is holding you captive. And you're holding yourself captive. You're in a jail cell. And God wants you to come out. So I ask you today, as Jesus hangs on the cross and says, Father, forgive them, but they know not what they do. Who in your life do you need to say that prayer to? Father, forgive them, but they don't know what they do. Forgiving someone doesn't mean forgetting. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that you've got to go on vacation with them. Forgiveness means freedom. Freedom from bondage. The bondage that holds you in that prison cell and allows yourself to continually be victimized over and over again. I say to you today, identify that wrong, identify that person, and ask God to forgive them. doesn't mean you have to go to them and ask their forgiveness. But just letting it go. Throwing open the cell door. As you leave today, Shelly or Shelly's going to have something for you. It's a key. And I intentionally didn't get a regular old key. I got skeleton keys. Because if I give you a regular key, you're eventually going to go, what does this key go to? I don't know. <laughs> and believe me, I know what that's like because I spent the last week with a whole bunch of keys from this place trying to figure out what they go to. So I'm giving you a skeleton key as a tangible reminder to allow yourself to be free. Open the cage. Open the jail cell. Turn yourself loose. Put it on your keychain. Put it in your pocket. Hang it somewhere where you can see it. As just a reminder to be quick to forgive. Don't hold on to that. Don't allow bitterness to take root. It doesn't do anybody any good. Unlock your prison. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, to see you on the cross, bloodied and beaten, and to hear you say words, Father, forgive them. Why is it so hard for us? what makes you God. It's what makes you God in the flesh. 
and we would do well to follow, to do what you do, to see your followers and, and, and the people that you died on the cross, to see them the way you do, to not hold on to the bitterness, to not hold on to the anger, but to freely let go and allow our hearts to be open and the prison door to be knocked down. Father, I pray for each and every person in here who, who has been wronged, who has been hurt by someone. I pray that their hearts will be opened up to the willingness and, and the, the, the desire to find forgiveness, knowing that they have been forgiven. We would do well to follow your example and freely forgive. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And as we enter into this time of Lent and, and this time of reflection and repentance, may we take these days leading up to Easter as a time to search our hearts and be obedient to you, to follow you, to stay on that path that leads to eternal life. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.